Good morning uh, to everyone in the United States and good afternoon to, uh, uh, to friends, colleagues, uh, and viewers joining us in Europe uh, and elsewhere around the world. My name is Jeff Rathke. I'm the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this, uh, this discussion uh, about uh, China policy in Europe and Germany uh, and relations with the United States on, on things uh, connected to China. Uh, we are really pleased to have three uh, German parliamentarians uh, active at the European and at the national level with us today to talk about uh, these issues and the prospects uh, for uh, German-American and transatlantic um, understanding on these issues. Now, the German government under Chancellor Angela Merkel has held out high hopes not too long ago uh, for relations with, uh, with China. Uh, China's role as the top external trading partner, the rhetorical commitment that uh, the Chinese uh, government has, uh, has given to multilateralism and international order, started the Donald Trump administration. All of this, just a couple of years ago, made uh, China an important partner for Berlin. But uh, China's growing assertiveness, its human rights crackdown, its economic model, which is based heavily on state-owned and state-subsidized uh, companies, and its aspiration for leading positions in the crucial technologies that will define the next decades of global development have ushered in a much more realistic and critical uh, view. Now, the, the lack of real progress at uh, last week's EU-China summit uh, is the latest evidence of this uh, cooling of, uh, of ties. And uh, you know, Germany's population has also grown skeptical. If you look at public opinion in Germany, um, in the US, there was a recent poll by Civi in which they asked the German public whether they favored um, closer ties or greater distance uh, to China. And 46% uh, called for more distance, which was 50% uh, more than the people um, who felt uh, that the status quo was preferable. In other words, 46% favor distance, 30% status quo. So we see in German as well as in European politics uh, a hardening of, uh, of views and policies toward China. We at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies uh, have uh, for many years focused on China policy as a crucial component of the transatlantic relationship. And, uh, and that's uh, why it's especially Im important to us to uh, host this discussion today. Um, uh, we're going to talk with, uh, with three parliamentarians. Uh, the first is Gude Jensen, who is a member of the Free Democratic Party uh, and the uh, chairperson of the Bundestag's uh, Committee on Human Rights. Uh, our second uh, guest is Reinhard Butikofer, who is the, uh, the co-chair of the European Greens and is also the head of the European Parliament's delegation for relations with China. Uh, and our third guest is Neil Schmid from the Social Democratic Party, member of the Bundestag and the spokesperson for foreign affairs in the SPD's Bundestag caucus. So in today's discussion, uh, we're going to look not only at uh, how, how views of China are changing, but what that means for us in the transatlantic relationship. And I'm really pleased uh, to start off today with, uh, with Gude Jensen. Um, Gude Jensen is from the state of Schleswig-Holstein. Uh, she has been a member of the Bundestag uh, since 2017. And as I mentioned, she's the chairperson of the Committee on, uh, on Human Rights. Um, and uh, so, uh, Gude Jensen, uh, why don't we start um, uh, uh, with, with you? And I, I would maybe ask, you know, you've been quoted recently um, with some critical statements about the German government's policy toward China. Um, you, have, uh, you have accused the German government, I believe, of uh, naivete uh, in its approach to China. And you've also said that the, um, the attitude or the, uh, the view that uh, of change through trade, handel durch handel, has failed. So could I ask you to share with us um, where do you see German relations with China now and what is missing from those relations when you criticize the government's policies? Um, I was I was on 
mute Andre. Um, first time that happened to me. Um, thanks for the question <laughs> and the invitation. Um, well, I think that is the most crucial uh, question there is in the whole context when it comes to EU, China, or um, German China relations. How has the rhetoric and the view of how China is dealing with trade, with human rights, with society issues um, in the world, um, how that has changed? And I said um, the government in Germany is naive when it comes to um, the way that China has um, has been growing a sort of influence in the world when you see uh, or take a look at the UN level, for example, um, when you take a look at human rights violations, not only in Hong Kong, but also in mainland China, and all that together um, doesn't show any uh, difference in uh, dealing with China from a German perspective. And I think that is naive. And some, sometimes I tend to think that maybe Chancellor Merkel and her colleagues um, are being advised by the one and only or by the same person that he or she already did um, 15 years ago. But things change over time. And I think that we should not, and you talked about the civi um, uh, questioning by um, of, of the population here. And I think it, it is not so much about um, having a more distant approach to China, but rather a more diverse one when it comes to Asia. So whenever we're talking about an, Asia, an Asian strategy or um, how to uh, how to cooperate um, or have a joint coordination with Asian countries, people tend to think it is only China. However, um, it is not. It is um, it is so many different countries, and I think the government in Germany needs to diversify um, its strategy when it comes to Asia. And, and um, if that takes place, I think we should we could be. Um, less dependent on just one country and um, maybe I'm gonna make a point there and then we can talk about details um, yes in other questions but I think this is the main question when it comes to a future in um, in German Chinese foreign relations okay now um, so your party the the free democratic party the FDP had a convention last weekend, uh, and your party leader, uh, Christian Lindner, um, uh, had a few things to say that related to China. And he pointed out that uh, the Chinese human rights uh, abuses, and in particular, the Hong Kong security law, he noted that the, uh, the uh, party-affiliated foundation, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, uh, had to close its, uh, its offices there um, uh, yeah. as a result. And uh, he, had a, uh, he, he had a quotation, he said, we are happy to pay a price because freedom and human rights are indivisible worldwide. Um, a very strong statement from the party leader, but what does that mean specifically in your view um, with respect um, to, uh, to, to China? What should the German Bundestag um, uh, be doing um, uh, in order to um, to advance uh, that uh, that objective, or is this really about rhetorical positioning? No, I think it's not only rhetoric. It, it is all about paying a price when it comes to um, maybe I, I'll just give you an example. Um, since one and a half to two years, we've been talking more and more about how should Germany react to human rights violations of the Communist Party in mainland China, but also the a situation in Hong Kong. And um, more and more, we talked about this openly in the plenary. And whenever we did that, not only from a human rights perspective, but also from a foreign relations, foreign affairs perspective, um, the, the Chinese embassy in Berlin submitted letters and um, um, stating their um, their grief about uh, how the German parliamentarians took over an internal topic of, um, or yeah, an internal topic of the Chinese politics. And um, th these letters were never sent to, to my office, for example, but always to Christian Lindner's office or to Mr. Schäuble's office, who is the Speaker of the House uh, of mm -hmm. the Parliament. So um, I think we also, we need to make sure that 
um, we simply state it is in, within our right to talk as free parliamentarians, it is within our right to talk about whatever topic we want in our uh, democratic parliament. And um, paying a price is, for example, closing down the Friedrich Naumann Foundation office in Hong Kong because we could no longer, or the foundation could no longer accept risking um, the life of or the safety of their co-workers who are living in Hong Kong. Um, so they basically paid the price by closing the office and not allowing to, um, to adapt too much to a security law, which nobody knows how far that will stretch. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is what Christian Nittner said or was thinking about when he said um, we need to pay a price and we happily, uh, we happily pay it um, if that is the consequence to defend some, some human rights that are just universal ones and China also has agreed upon. Yeah. Now, you've also called for Germany to, uh, to pass a, uh, uh, a so-called Magnitsky style yes. uh, law. Um, uh, that would allow sanctions against people who are um, credibly accused of violating human rights. Uh, how do you see the, the likelihood uh, of, of this legislation passing? Um, uh, where, where, where do you see that taking, uh, taking you in Germany? Well, I think there is two levels we need to talk about a potential Magnitsky Act, um, a sanction regime for human rights violators. The one level we're talking about, or we've been talking about on the German level, um, that will only go on as far as the EU is not able to adopt a Magnitsky law on the European level, because I think we are all, we can all agree that um, when the EU passes such a law, it should be or it will be more effective um, because it shows that European countries can unite behind this, this sanction regime. But so far, um, I'm hearing different kind of voices when it comes to the likelihood of passing such a law on the European level. So I called on the German government to go forward um, and um, make a good example of what Germany can do so far, as long as the European Parliament and um, the Council has not agreed on a Magnitsky law mm -hmm. in Brussels, because we need consensus to do that. And I think Mr. Butikofer can, um, is an expert on that, but I would, I would love to see that um, these kind of decisions when it comes to foreign relations of the European Union are being made with a qualified majority rather than with, with consensus. Yeah, um, we'll move to Reinhard Butikofer in just, a, in just a second, but one last question and that is, um, Gudi Jensen, do you have, how, how would you characterize the contact that you have with American counterparts uh, in, the, in the House and the Senate uh, on the, the issues in your committee's purview? Are you satisfied uh, with that? No, I think that is, um, that is a task that I would point to myself, that I should be in a better contact with colleagues overseas because, and um, across the world, actually, the only way I am connected to uh, parliamentarians and also legislators from the state is um, within the, um, the APAC, the Alliance on, on China policies that we just formed a few months ago. So that is definitely something we should work on more so that coordinated um, motions, but also opinion making process. Okay, so room for improvement in the, uh, in the, in the connections more, between. Definitely. Yes. Um, all right. Um, well, thank you. Um, uh, we're going to switch to Reinhard Butikoff for now, and this is perhaps a good, a good transition because we've just heard about um, uh, the Magnitsky-style uh, uh, law uh, on the European level as well. But Reinhard uh, Butikoffer, could I first ask you for your assessment of the, uh, the EU-China summit uh, which took place last week um, and what that means for the, uh, the, the relations between uh, the Europe the European Union uh, and China. Where do you see that right now? Thank you, Jeff, first of all, for having me. It's always a pleasure to work with AICGS. Um, I would say that 
the uh, video conference, uh, the video mini summit that they had, that uh, President uh, von der Leyen called the quadrilogue, uh, has been an encouragement to Europeans and a disappointment to Xi Jinping and Mrs. Merkel. Um, what we saw at that summit was that there are presently two China policies around Europe. One is the China policy of the Chancellor, and the other is the China policy of the EU. And increasingly, the two are not in sync. You heard that when um, uh, President von der Leyen uh, described the, the exchange as open and frank, uh, which normally uh, is diplomatic speak, uh, expressing uh, the fact that uh, partners have been telling each other off, while Mrs. Merkel described the conversation as good, honest, and open, which is uh, putting a different tone, and I would call that putting uh, lipstick on a pig. Um, also, the, uh, the attitude that the two ladies took uh, in describing the perspectives of the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment were quite different. Uh, Mrs. Uh, von der Leyen took a very skeptical stance. I think that's realistic. While the chancellor um, literally said that she was sure there was enough political will on either side to conclude the agreement uh, before the end of the year. Uh, I haven't seen, and, and nobody around Brussels has seen a willingness on the part of the Chinese to meet the uh, to provide the necessary uh, concessions that we need in order to uh, consider such an agreement worthwhile having. Uh, so either she's fooling herself or she was about saying, look, I'm willing to take whatever he's willing to give. Uh, but as things stand, I would say today um, there has been an, uh, a, an interesting change. At the beginning of the year, Germany meant to drive the EU's China agenda. And today, the EU's China agenda drives Germany. And for Xi Jinping, that was also disappointing. And that came uh, in one fell swoop with uh, the disappointing visit of Foreign Minister Wang Yi and, and uh, the visit of Jiang uh, Europeans, in a very peaceful but determined way stuck to their guns. In the last uh, summit, uh, video summit also, in June, uh, Europeans have, had been telling China quite frankly that we have had it with all the promises, that there is a lot of promise fatigue among politicians, also among the business community, and either China picks up or packs up. Um, and uh, there have increasingly also been voices from the business community that, that have taken a very firm stand saying, look, if it's not worth having, let's not have it. And uh, uh, if, it, if China can't decide by the end of the year, maybe we should, uh, we should look elsewhere. So uh, this is still a transitional period, but uh, Europe has been coming together more than we have in the past. This is because the, um, the, the very special role that Germany has been playing is uh, having a less dominant uh, influence at the moment. Uh, the very special expectations that some Eastern and Southeastern European nations had been pursuing in the format of the so-called 17 plus one uh, parallel track diplomacy with China have uh, these hopes have uh, been severely disappointed so europeans are learning that we have to hang together or we will all hang separately in the words of uh, um, one of your founding fathers and uh, yes uh, the uh, the summit was testimony to that okay well, uh, Reinhard, so what then are the next steps from your point of view in the European Parliament? Um, uh, is uh, what, what, what should come next uh, on the agenda? Is it simply waiting until the end of the year to, uh, to see whether 
the, uh, there's progress on the comprehensive agreement on investment, which of course would have to be approved, right, in the, in the European Parliament? Or is Without there more that the, the, that the EP should be doing in the, in the near term? As you say, without the consent of the European Parliament, no international treaty of the European Union will ever come into force. Uh, I think the Chinese are, haven't been realizing that to the fullest yet. Um, but uh, clearly we have a very active agenda. Um, Kita Jensen already mentioned the Global Human Rights Sanctions Mechanism. We've been working on that very actively and uh, uh, in her State of the Union, uh, said of the European Union speech, President von der Leyen mentioned it again and said the Commission was going to make a proposal now. And there are chances that we could finalize that possibly even under the German presidency, which would be before the end of the year or at the latest next year. So that that is moving forward. Then we are um, moving uh, on the uh, issues of anti-subsidy policy. The European uh, Commission has published a white paper on uh, how to push back against uh, subsidies that are illegal under WTO rules. Uh, the, the, the white paper doesn't say China, but it's all about China. And uh, we're going to work on that. We're also going to work uh, to promote the uh, international procurement instrument, which uh, looks at procurement markets and uh, says, look, we want to implement the principle of reciprocity. And if they don't up, open up their markets, why should we keep our markets open just as if nothing had happened? Then uh, we will uh, uh, try to, um, to force from the European Parliament steps that go in a similar direction as uh, steps uh, that uh, US Congress and uh, US government have been taking on forced labor uh, of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and in other parts of China, uh, were um, trying to influence um, the, deba the debate about 5G, where mm -hmm. I think uh, the game is tilting now against Huawei. I would dare predicting that Huawei will not be included in the, ger the German rollout of 5G uh, technology. Uh, this would have been a very improbable prediction a year ago. So you see what has changed. And uh, the European uh, Parliament is uh, playing a very active role. I would say we have a, a very high level of cooperation between the socialist group, the Christian democratic group, the liberal group, the Greens group, and the conservative group, uh, which is a vast majority of the European Parliament. And we also have very good cooperation with uh, parliamentarians uh, in the international arena. Uh, Gita Jensen has already mentioned IPAC, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, where you have, for instance, uh, Senators Menendez or Rubio representing the United States. Uh, so uh, I think the parliament is a real driver there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a similar question to what I asked Gita Jensen: How satisfied are you with the transatlantic? dialogue uh, on China-related issues. You've listed uh, a number that uh, touch upon uh, the, the, whole, the whole gamut of, of, of foreign affairs questions. Um, is there sufficient uh, transatlantic discussion of these issues, in your view? No, there's not. But uh, there have been some very encouraging developments. So the German ambassador in Washington has played a very active role in that regard. And she has cooperated successfully with CSIS, for instance. Uh, then uh, people from the NSC have uh, very proactively um, tried to, and uh, successfully tried to talk to your, uh, the European um, think tank community and, and uh, uh, China specialists in the foreign ministries in, in different European countries, including in the in the European Union. And uh, the latest very positive development was uh, when um, HRVP Borel, our uh, representative for foreign policy, um, uh, offered a transatlantic dialogue on China to the Trump administration. It took Secretary Pompeo a couple of days before he could um, understand his luck, and then he happily accepted. Um, 
And I think this will go forward um, regardless of uh, who wins the election. And I see four main issues, three main issues that we will be talking about hopefully with either hypothetical president. And of course, one very important issue that would be taken on board if Biden wins. Uh, so trade is already uh, a, a clear uh, nominee for cooperation. Mm -hmm. And we've worked with the uh, Japanese also uh, on WTO reform. That's been then, the most successful of these areas thus far, right? Indeed, yeah. indeed. And if you listen to AMCHAM or the European Chamber of Commerce in Beijing, they have the same sound. Um, uh, then um, I think we should coordinate on human rights related initiatives. That's what parliamentarians are already doing. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, Senator Kuhns and Senator Rubio sent a letter to von der Leyen and to Borrell um, inviting them to, to work together more consequentially in, in that regard. I saw that as a very positive initiative. The third element is multilateral institutions. The Chinese wage oversized influence in multilateral institutions from uh, UN-related institutions to uh, institutions like ITU and others. And I think it's, it's been partly our negligence. And the, the fact that uh, some countries have, at times when it was not mandated, withdrawn from playing their role in multilateral institutions that have weakened our ability to withstand uh, uh, overly ambitious Chinese uh, um, uh, interference. So, so I think we should work on that. And then, of course, climate change would certainly merit a strong cooperation, and I mm -hmm. uh, I've given up on um, ever expecting President Trump to understand it, but I know that if we would have a Trump uh, a Biden administration, that could also be a very strong plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reinhard. Um, I'm going to um, uh, turn to Neil Schmid, but before I do, let me just give a reminder to all of our viewers out there. We are using the Q and A uh, function um, on your screen. Um, so if you would like to pose a question, um, please use that uh, box to uh, to submit it to us. And uh, the more succinct and the more um, uh, clearly formulated your question, the higher the likelihood I'm going to choose it. So uh, so we look forward to taking those uh, in just a few minutes. But Neil Schmid, let me turn to you now. Um, Neil Sch Schmid is a member of the German Bundestag from the Social Democratic Party. Um, he has been, uh, like Gude Jensen, a member since 2017, and he is the spokesperson for foreign affairs in the SP the Bundestag uh, caucus. Um, I would also highlight that the Social Democratic Party's caucus in the Bundestag recently uh, published a new position paper on, uh, on China. Um, and that's where I'd like to start, uh, Neil Schmid. Um, how could you give us your assessment of, uh, of, of Germany's view and of the Social Democratic Party's view um, uh, of the um, uh, of, of China policy, and, and in particular in the context of the growing tensions between the United States uh, and, and China. Well, first of all, Jeff, I would like to thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure uh, to be on a panel uh, of your distinguished uh, institution. Um, yes, um, you're right. Uh, German perception of China is uh, shifting, is changing quite rapidly for at least uh, in a German context. <laughs> um, and uh, that's why we were the first party to, to elaborate on a, a strategy paper on how to deal with uh, China in the future. Um, this change of mind uh, comes from two main uh, sources. Uh, one is the growing awareness that um, there is an unfair competition going on out there with uh, Chinese companies. They are taking over very valuable assets uh, from German companies. Uh, one of the most famous cases in point uh, was the takeover of KUKA, a robotics firm, yeah. uh, without opening up their market and without um, protecting intellectual property uh, in a decent way. Uh, and the second uh, main reason uh, for 
a new China debate in, in Germany was indeed some influence coming over from uh, the US. So uh, the China debate in the US started earlier than in Europe. So think tanks, also policy makers in, in US and Washington started to debate the role of China, the rise of China, and the challenge it uh, poses uh, to the world, to the Western world especially. Uh, and uh, in, in a way, we uh, continued this debate um, under European uh, terms. And what comes out of it is the idea that, and that's the, 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 the red uh, thread uh, in our uh, paper, um, that China has to be regarded as a competitor, as a partner when it comes to global issues like uh, China, uh, climate change, but also as a systemic rival. And now comes the point, you cannot choose between the, the three. Um, the overarching um, uh, dimension of our relationship with China is systemic competition because to a quite a high degree, systemic rivalry also limits possibilities of cooperation and also influences the way competition between China and the rest of the world uh, works or does not work. And so we have to take into account that China is not only a huge market. That was for a very long time the dominant view in Germany. It was all about business opportunities, about the market, the huge growth uh, potential of the Chinese uh, domestic market. And we have to broaden our view and we have, we have to understand that foreign policy is more than promoting export interests of uh, big uh, German firms. Mm -hmm. And this is what we integrated in our thinking, unfortunately, especially Chancellor Merkel still adheres to this outdated model of uh, business opportunities uh, to to a to a model of thought which I would call the hypothesis of convergence. The idea that through trade through improving economic relations, you might trigger a sort of political liberalization. And with the Xi Jinping presidency in China, this idea has been refuted, at least temporarily. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it will, uh, uh, this will change uh, 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 in, in some years' time, but for the time being, we have to take China as it is. And so we have also to adapt our strategy and to to take on this uh, Chinese challenge, as, as I would uh, like to call it. And for Germany, as Reinhard uh, Bittikofer rightly mentioned, this is a very new idea because for many years, we had the most prominent relationship of all the European uh, countries with uh, China, a very close relationship due to economic cooperation. And we have to free our thinking and ourselves from this quite narrow-minded uh, set of thinking. If, we, if there is a case in which we need decoupling, then it is decoupling German foreign policy from the interests of big companies in Germany. This is a, so because big companies in Germany, as any other companies, are geopolitically blind. They, are, they, are, they, they take not into account what's going on, on in broader geopolitical terms. And this, has, this, this must also have a direct effect on the way Germany and the European Union directs its uh, foreign policy towards China. Yeah. So, uh, Neil Schmidt, uh, if I could pick up on that question, that, that uh, aspect of rebalancing um, Germany's economic uh, relationship with China. Um, we've heard from Reinhard Butikoffer some of the ideas that are under discussion in the European Parliament. Um, where do you see, and where does the perhaps the Social Democratic uh, Caucus in the Bundestag see the balance between 
um, doing things at a European level. You've just talked about uh, uh, you know, uh, decoupling uh, German policy from uh, s the interests of large firms. Um, but it, it seems that it's also a question of where you find the balance of European level policies versus national policies. Um, sometimes I think uh, Germany uh, pursues its, uh, its policies in the assumption that they are European, when in fact they're not always shared by all of its European uh, Union partners. There, there's some truth to that, and I'm definitely um, in favor of a more pro-European pro um, uh, China policy, and that means that Germany needs to take into account um, the interests of European partners, especially of smaller ones. You know, even such a big country as Germany cannot really stand up to uh, China alone, and that is also what is uh, the, what um, our smaller partners, uh, for example, the Czech Republic, have been experiencing in the last few months. So I believe that um, China is the big issue for a stronger common uh, European foreign policy, and I must say that Macron gave some good um, impetus uh, to that by inviting um, Merkel to his meeting with uh, Xi Jinping in Paris last year, by taking European commissioners and German federal ministers on his trip to Beijing. These, are, these were very, very good signals, and I believe that Germany should do the same, and uh, we can only defend our vital interests, not only vis-a-vis -vis China, but also vis-a-vis -vis the US, for example, by having a, a unified um, a European uh, attitude and, and position. And, you know, Germany has taken some time to understand it, but now, um, because it's so much exposed in economic terms to China, we also feel the urgent need to rebalance it. And that's why the German government published its Indo-Pacific guidelines some weeks ago. And to me, this shows that all aspects of our Asia policy must be reconsidered and we must invest more in our political, economic, social, cultural relationship uh, with um, Asian countries. Mm -hmm. And there's a fallacy a misperception by very widespread among European and especially German companies that goes as follows. China is a huge market. You have 300 million middle class people there. Another 300 million uh, will come in the next 10 years. So it's all fine because we are in this market. We're going to just uh, reap the, the fruits of growth uh, quite naturally, automatically. And that's not true because Chinese company will not accept foreign companies to gain as much uh, market share in the, in the future uh, growth of the Chinese national economy as they did in the last 20 years. And that's why our companies should be smarter, quicker, and should be more open to invest in maybe more difficult markets, but also very promising markets in other parts uh, of Asia. Uh, Bangladesh has 100 million people, Pakistan almost 100 million people. You have India, you have Indonesia, you have ASEAN. So there are so many market op business opportunities outside of China. And we have to, from the political, uh, from as policymakers, we have to encourage our companies uh, to, to be uh, to be more alert um, and more open to business opportunities in other parts of the world. And mm -hmm. so that's why I really um, recommend uh, reading these uh, Indo-Pacific guidelines because uh, it gives us uh, some overview of, of what the German government, together with its European partners, uh, should do in the future in, in this part of the world. Okay. I think we will come back to talk more about the indo Pacific strategy, because I think we've got a lot of questions about that that have been popping up. Um, let me start, though, with a general question to each of you, and I'll turn to Gudi Jensen uh, first, uh, perhaps. 
Uh, and the question is, does Germany underestimate the amount of leverage it has with China? And is that, uh, do you think that will change in a future German government? Um, so it's a question about Germany's uh, influence and ability to influence. I think Germany underestimates itself when it comes to the leverage that we have within the European Union towards China, but also as um, the Federal Republic. Because, and I think actually that Chancellor Merkel still has the chance to uh, pull some strings to um, to also, um, well, use her way of um, having such a consistent governing mode. She's a very calm person. And I think um, from an Asian perspective on on her way of, um, of ruling a country um, is a very positive one. And I think she could have some say in the last or in the last months of her of her chancellor um, ship. And I expected her to do that, especially when it came uh, came to the um, her speech on the at the Europe um, at the Munich Security Conference, not this year, but last year. Um, we had standing ovations there, and she just uh, announced that she wouldn't seek another term um, as the um, chairmanship um, and for the chancellery. And I thought maybe she she could really make a difference when it comes to the tone to the rhetoric uh, towards China. And so far, I'm missing um, her, well, freeness in a way that she can also act upon because she's not seeking another term without leaving a whole concept of calmness in, in her way of, of addressing things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're underestimating um, Germany also when it comes to um, to well, the mindset, but also um, the German knowledge um, that is um, that is also very welcomed in China in order to um, to fill in certain positions. And I think we're always talking about being dependent on China, but I think it's it's not a it's not a one way street. That's also what experts say, and I think we should not dive into that narrative too deep. Yeah. Um Thank you, Reinhard Butikofer. Uh, you know, Germany has also lagged a bit behind uh, the European um, uh, momentum, uh, let's say. But does Germany? Do you do you think Germany underestimates its uh, its influence in in these uh, in these respects? I think you're muted, Reinhard. Germany is very proud of. Um having struck such an intense and, and wide-ranging partnership with, uh, with China. And uh, at the moment, I, I think they overestimate uh, their influence. And, and partly that stems from successes that they have had in the past. So, uh, I mean, it, it merits being recalled that the chancellor was one of the few European leaders that would always publicly talk about human rights in China. That made a very positive distinction in her favor. And she managed to convince Xi Jinping that he should let uh, the widow of late uh, Li Xiaobo um, emigrate to Berlin. So she, she did achieve stuff by pursuing um, Max Weber's advice, dicke uh, yeah, Bretterbohren, to, to drill uh, holes patiently into thick boards of wood. But what we, she missed was that with her wood drill, she's now sitting in front of a steel plate. Mm -hmm. the, the character of China has changed, and Xi Jinping's China is not Deng Xiaoping's China, it's not Hu Jintao's China. It's a China that is more aggressive, uh, and uh, she still and her people still believe that if they just continue arguing, they will at one point uh, finally convince the Chinese. And I think we're way beyond that point. And today, uh, uh, the, the, the shared orientations are not there anymore. Uh, China is not pursuing uh, the goal of being a responsible stakeholder globally. China is pursuing the goal of overturning the global governance system. 
And in, in that regard, the only effective answer would be to put a price on everything that China does that we think hurts our interests or our values too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've heard two different opinions here on this. Uh, Neil Schmidt, uh, where, where do you come down on Germany's uh, influence, uh, ability to exercise influence uh, on China? So, well, I think Reinhard is right in stressing the fact that uh, in the past, uh, Germany was quite successful in sort of influencing. Um, but we've come to a point where Germany can only ex exert uh, influence when uh, it uh, unites its forces with uh, its European partners and in a broader sense with the US when it comes to trade, for example. I would have preferred uh, to have a, a more consultation or at least some kind of consultation uh, among allies uh, 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 as we we ha we could expect uh, due to our long-standing uh, transatlantic friendship, and it would have been even more effective um, uh, if uh, Trump had associated uh, European governments more to to his uh, approach on, on on China. So I believe that um, in the future we should try to um, to take on the the Chinese, China challenge uh, by uh, joining forces together between uh, Washington and Brussels. And um, the influence we can exercise will find its limits in the nature of the uh, communist power system in, in, in China. So, so we should not focus too much on the personality of the president in a way, what the president does is what is needed to keep the Communist Party in power. It's not only about his uh, personal instincts or, or whatsoever. It's about uh, keeping a authoritarian regime in power because, as I've mentioned with the idea of convergence, sooner or later, further steps down the road of liberalization, of economic liberalization, would open up forces within Chinese society, which might put into doubt, uh, uh, which might question the ultimate power of the, the Communist Party. So um, that's why we need a more robust uh, approach, uh, policy approach uh, from, from the West uh, towards this more assertive and in sometimes even aggressive China. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll stick with you, Neil Schmidt, because you mentioned the, um, the, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the German government, uh, and we've had a number of questions about that. Um, and you talked uh, also in your remarks earlier about the importance of diversifying um, relations across uh, Asia. I think Gude Jensen also uh, used the word uh, diversification. Um, so, how how far reaching do you see um, uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, being? And in particular, when you talk about uh, the cooperation with the United States, should that also be, um, should that extend to the military or security era, area when it comes to um, uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific? Um, how, how, how expansive or focused do you think the Indo-Pacific strategy should be? Well, first of all, I would state that the advantage, big advantage of uh, the German government's Indo-Pacific strategy is that it covers all dimensions of our relationship uh, with the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So it's not only about economics, it's not only about security, uh, it's about all these dimensions. And so the military dimension, of course, is included, uh, especially when it comes to freedom of navigation. And I believe that, uh, that we can do something about it. But once again, as in other aspects as well, this Indo-Pacific strategy is destined to be a European one. So it's an offer to our European partners uh, to bring our act together, to join forces and to um, uh, develop a common European Indo-Pacific strategy. And in this context, 
context. There might also be some room and there should be some room for freedom of navigation operations. And this could also include uh, cooperation with the, uh, with the US. They have already published their Indo-Pacific strategy. And so I'm looking forward to have some uh, debates uh, on, on, on these uh, strategies. But for us, especially for us as social democrats, it's very important uh, to emphasize that it's not only about security and military, um, uh, it's also about a, a comprehensive approach, uh, including um, all the levers uh, we have, we can use as Europeans in our relations with these uh, nations. Uh, considering especially the fact that many Asian nations do not ex expect uh, Germany to send uh, military vessels uh, to the South China uh, Sea. They, def uh, they expect uh, other things uh, from us and uh, we should also uh, um, count on our uh, strength, uh, which is not, uh, not necessarily a military one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> Goody Jensen, I wanted to turn to you uh, in particular with, uh, because we've got a question about um, the, uh, the matter of uh, supply chains and human rights, labor rights uh, in the context of, of the supply chains of Germany and the EU. Um, and there have also been proposals to require firms um, to undertake greater due diligence uh, to ensure their supply chains uh, don't violate human rights. Um, so how, uh, what, um, uh, what is your view on uh, what, the, uh, what the, the national approach uh, should be in this regard? Um, and how does that uh, fit into the, the work of the Human Rights uh, uh, Committee uh, in, in the Bundestag? Well, first of all, um, I think we should all agree that human rights within supply chains are as important as uh, in other parts of uh, our lives. And um, the question, or we, we're talking about this question a lot, especially when it comes to the reports of the Uyghurs, uh, the, the Uyghurs uh, camps in uh, Xinjiang, but also other parts um, where especially German companies, but Europeans as well, um, should be able to rule out that there is any kind of um, forced labor, for example. And if they're not able to rule that out, um, companies, or it should be in the company's own interest to, um, to change supplies, but also to make sure that um, official inquiries are, um, are being met when it comes to full transparency um, and human rights violations should never be uh, should never be enshrined or a part of um, a logical um, mm -hmm. way companies work. Uh, currently, we are discussing this um, on a national level. Um, do we need or the question is being asked, do we need a supply chain um, legislation or um, do we need one on the European level? So basically the, the same um, approach as the Magnitsky law as well. And in my opinion, it would be a more um, robust approach from a European perspective because um, European countries could have certain standards that, um, that they could bring forward together rather than one or two countries. And uh, we see that certain countries in the European Union are already um, passed, have already passed these kind of legislations, for example, the Netherlands, but also the Brits. Um, so I would, I would call for a supply, chain, a supply chain legislation on the European level, but if we do not see anything um, anytime soon, I think Germany also in that, uh, question should go forward um, and not just negate this um, this debate because um, people well, the people want to understand why uh, we shouldn't talk about uh, more tr transparency and also more due diligence within supply chains and I think we could not justify not dealing with that um, in a more 
um, detailed way as we do so far. So then I'll turn to, to you, Reinhard Butikofer. Um, uh, uh, if I understand from Gude Jensen, uh, her preference is that this be done at the European level, but if not, um, national steps are, are in order. Um, what's the prospect for, uh, for movement uh, within the European Parliament uh, in, this, in this regard in the, in the foreseeable future? The, sorry. The prospects are pretty good. Uh, the Parliament is pushing hard and the Commission has promised that it will pick that up and uh, uh, the, the Commissioner for Trade um, and uh, the Commissioner for Judicial Affairs have both pledged that next year they will come forward with a proposal. So I would expect that uh, the discussions that we're having at the moment in Germany will be fed into that European process. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us uh, to the close of, uh, of our session. Um, I want to thank uh, Gudi Jensen, Reinhard Butikofer, and Neil Schmid for sharing your time with us. And uh, it's been a real uh, honor for us to have uh, three of the, uh, the voices that are uh, you know, generating the most new ideas uh, and uh, pushing uh, the China discussion forward uh, at the European and at the national level. Uh, so good to have you with us today, and thank you to all of our viewers uh, who have uh, submitted questions and joined us for this uh, this discussion. Uh, you know, China policy will remain a, 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 pre, a key focus of the research and events of AICGS, and so we look forward to having you with us in the future. Um, visit our website to read some of our publications, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you next time. Um, thanks uh, to all of you, and uh, auf Wiedersehen.